welcome, thank you. We're going to go through this quite fast because I've got 50 years and just about 50 minutes. Um, first of all, I want to thank both Mick Hudson and Viv Raven who are part of this project, but we'll get to their roles in a moment and where they've helped us. So that's what we're going to do today. A um, bit of the early days, a bit around the civil service department, a bit about establishing a profession, some growth and post 2000. I'm conscious there are some of the characters that feature in this story are in the room. We may have some things wrong, and in which case, tell us afterwards and we'll correct them. But let us go with the story for now. Um, around that February 2013, I found myself wandering the streets of South Kensington, as you do. And I was walking around and I walked into the Science Museum and I was surprised to find this unannounced exhibition that was there. I hadn't seen it was up there. And it was called Churchill Scientists. And I thought, come on, get in, get your asses in gear. <laughs> Sorry, that's not what I thought. <laughs> the Stragglers bus again has arrived. And I was walking through, and I've been an operational researcher all my life. Well, I think I have. I've been modelling, I've been doing mathematical models, I've been doing analysis in government. And I walked in, and the first thing I saw behind the placard was this sign. And it said operational research. And I actually was nearly bowled over to see something in the Science Museum saying operational research, and it started to talk about the history. Now, this has been well rehearsed by a number of people, including some here today, but certainly in various parts of the conference. But it talks about the history, it talks about Blackett, it talks about the Battle of the Atlantic and various aspects. It talks about the statistics branch and how they were there presenting information to Churchill and what they were covering there with their, their charts. I quite like this one where they're looking at the different areas that cargo was coming into the UK from provincial trading areas, and each of these pie charts represents a month, but they're hand-drawn. And some poor sap had to go away and draw these by hand. And I do believe the different sizes do relate to the different amounts of cargo. But nice early days of data viz there during the war. Um, then there were sort of the practical applications. Hopefully you can see that. That's one of those classic little scenes you see, you know, with the people pushing all of the planes around on a map. And this is a sector clock. And the problem was they didn't know the latency of the information on the map. But by colouring in the little triangles there, showing which five-minute period the information related to, they were able to... Oh, that's not come out well. They were able to quickly establish, actually, whether it was five minutes old, ten minutes old, fifteen minutes old, quite critical in order to understand um, how relevant the information was and where they were going to... Uh, put their fighters. This is the cast and crew at that particular time. Some very famous names in there. Obviously, Blackett and a few others you will recognise. Um, part of Blackett's circus, some of these. But they had direct access straight the way up to Churchill. Key aspect of that is the multi multidisciplinary group that you have there with very different professions. And just to go back to this diagram, which is a really poor photo. Um, I took it, so I apologise for that. Um, but that there is a memo, and I've reproduced it. Blackett's letter to the Admiralty, scientist at the operational level, notes on statement to Admiralty panel on the function of an operational research station. The object of having scientists in close touch with operations is to enable operational staffs to obtain scientific advice on those matters which are not handled by the service technical establishments. Operational research is the method by which such scientists acquire the knowledge to enable them to give them useful advice. Nice early documentation of the term OR, how it was used in the military, and a copy of the original memo. I think it's the original memo. It looks authentic enough. Anyway, lots of this was documented in Maurice Kirby's book, Operational Research in War and Peace, but this book actually went up to about 1970. Bits of it carried on a bit further. In fact, there's a few bits about government afterwards. But what's all this got to do with government OR? So, I wanted to find out more about our history and seeing that bit walking around South Kensington Museum, I was interested in what was going on. And after about 30 years in government, I was realising that quite a lot of the people who were around in the period at the early start of civil OR, sadly, were passing away. And lots of others were disappearing off the radar. And what we wanted to do was just to start to collect because we realised there was a great big gap in our history from around about the late 1960s, early 1970s through to the modern day. And this is where we got together and I approached Mick Hudson, who's sitting here at the front, partly because he was one of those early pioneers 
about how, whether you'd be interested in actually helping me pull together some of the history. We fired off some emails to a few people in contact lists, and these contact lists then grew and grew, and then we got more and more, and then we found out people didn't agree with each other, and then we got more information back, and we started to collate it. And with Mick's help, and with Viv's help in actually keeping us on the straight and narrow and keeping this operation working, we decided we were going to take on this history of Gore's committee work, and we were going to produce something which will document this part of our background. So, a bit about mine. I started in education and science in 86, education and employment in 92, education and skills 2001, Prime Minister's Delivery Unit 21 to 2008, which happened to be in two departments, uh, then the Department of Health, and I'm currently now in the Ministry of Defence. So what? Um, I've had seven departments. I've had many, many jobs, but I've only had one career. And that career is working in government OR. And that's what I like. That's what I'm passionate about. And that's what I wanted to learn more about. So this is our story. Post-war, and Maurice Kirby records a lot of this, there was OR in the military and it continued, but it struggled to take hold in civil departments. Obviously, there's the iron and steel industries, and coal, private sector expansion. And there's an example of a number of departments, gov uh, sorry, government departments, sorry a number of organisations which used operational research were recorded through the 1960s. So it had wide application in the private sector. Go on, take your seats. There were a few public sector examples, some in local governments, uh, the Royal Institute for Public Administration, City of Coventry in collecting rubbish, Kent School Buses, London County Council. Uh, there was a local government OR unit established in 64. And it mentions the police research and development branch in, established in 1962 in the Home Office. And this really is the precursor to our story. OR in the Home Office started early. So in 1962, it was established in the PRDB. Um, later, the Scientific Advisory Branch and Scientific Research and Development Branch, they really had snappy titles in those days. But the key part of this is in the second and fourth paragraph there is about the way that they integrated analysts in with the operational people, the police officers, the police constables, the detectives, etc., on how they understood the business. And it was working together in that way which allowed them to provide solutions for real time. And there's a couple of the characters there under Alex McDonald, they put a thriving OR team in there led by Peter Turner, and Ross Tristam and Richard Gibbs, and a couple of others as well. And what was found interesting is we're picking up names of people some of you may know, but I certainly didn't. But it was really interesting to find out who these characters were. So what did they do? Early work on uh, police cars, which was replacing bobbies on the beat with panda cars because it was more effective. Uh, regional crime squads. That picture there is um, the great train robbery. And regional crime squads came out of how they needed to organise themselves in order to support uh, investigations after the Great Train Robbery. And it was now became the National Crime Agency. Other projects included the computerisation of fingerprints, command and control issues, and traffic, traffic control and photo fit and identikit. And I heard from one of the anecdotes that was related back to us that they believed that the original mug shots the pieces used for the photo fit were probably the early OR pioneers of their day. <laughs> OK, so that brings us on to the Civil Service Department. Why 1968 and why do I think it's 50 years, if OR in the Home Office started before that? In 1968, there was the Fulton Report. The report of the committee, it took them three years to write by Lord Fulton, and it challenged the Treasury's position as Finance Ministry and owners of the Civil Service HR policy. The idea that they were in charge of HR, in charge of finance, well, you can see where that was going to lead, and it was not going to be a good place. Um, and the report recommended to establish the Civil Service Department to spread modern management methods in the Civil Service. Now, when I say modern management methods, remember this is 1968. Fulton provided the OR Society an opportunity to promote and bring in and contribute to the overall um, consultation. The memorandum was drafted by Rolf Tomlinson, Tony Flowerdew, and was presented to the committee by the president of the society, then president of the society, Robert, Roger Edison. And they recommended the creation of a central group to contribute OR resource to national and regional planning problems 
and to contribute problem solving at departmental levels. Okay, I've been around a while and I've seen these sorts of things happen, I've seen these sorts of reports go through, and I've seen the recommendations and I've seen the lobby groups, and not much happens. However, they recommend its location as central government department or as a special agency, and there was a friend, a friend in the, the career civil servant, Sir William Armstrong, actually head of the Home Civil Service when he took over the Civil Service Department, and he was a fan of OR. And that meant he, could, he thought he could achieve a lot in the civil service, and he wanted to make sure the analysis, analysts in CSD, the civil service department, made the most of it. And him and his team actually went down to defence, the defence operational analysis establishment, and sufficiently persuaded the value of OR to recruit their deputy director, Ken James. And he was brought in to work in their management division in the centre of the civil service department. So, it was 50 years ago, in 1968, that Ken James transfers from Defence to lead the Civil Service Department's own group. And you've got to think then, this is one in the Treasury, part, it's part of the Treasury, Civil Service Department, but it's actually looking at cross-government issues. It's no longer looking at single departmental issues. And for me, I think this is the sort of birthplace of where we have cross-government OR working together as a corporate entity. Ken arrived just in time to see the meeting and the, where the memorandum from the OR Society was being discussed. And actually, um, it, since uh, Sir William had been convinced of the value of OR, it was perfectly serendipitous. Everything just fitted together at the right time. And actually, that allowed us to create, rather than to create, a, a, senior, a civil service department with OR people in its core roles. And I list the number of them there, some of them whom you may know. By October 1970, Following significant recruitment, or at least significant recruitment for the time, there were about 20 analysts plus consultants and support staff. So they'd established this central team. So some early projects. Some of these may sound mundane, but actually you've got to realise you've got to start to make an impression early. Here we've got one about checking Her Majesty's Stationery Office's invoices. They realised that they were checking every invoice, but the amount they were actually finding in errors was actually less than the amount of time it was taking to cost to actually check the invoice. So they put some tolerances in there and only started to check ones above a certain amount, and they demonstrated that OR could make savings. Quick win, early start, we're on, a, we're on a roll. Location of government, big issue at the time. How do we actually look at the rationalisation of government offices in different parts of the country? But here it's not just the physically how much it costs to transport them, but what is the knock-on effect to the communication links that are required with the individual teams? How do you compartmentalise parts of the government into different parts of an organisation in order to bring around whether you need video links, telecoms, and remember it's still in the early 1970s, what kind of technology can support you in that process? And then we had D-Day. Not the old one, but decimalisation. Um, how much was the pint of beer in 1971? One and six. One and six. Post-decimalisation. Fifteen p. How much for the loaf of bread? Ten p. Pint of milk. And a pack of twenty cigarettes. Twenty-seven p for a pack. Of, basically, just over a penny a fag. Pennies were important. And actually, this was a big thing because what you're doing is bringing in a completely new coinage system on day one, and you have many sectors and organisations that need to have change. So you've got the logistics problem, not only getting it to them, but how much should you meet? And the initial estimates that were coming out from the Royal Mint were suggesting a figure, but actually it was a study that was done by the Civil Service Department said it should be much less. And they worked together with them to work out, um, I think it was Alan Hawley at the time was, was part of the team who was doing that, and they were just trying to estimate how many coins get lost in the system because people collect them, they store them, they go down the back of sofas, they're in jars. So the Royal Mint had a much, uh, much too high value on how many coins were required for the point of transition. And they were able to estimate how much was required, much less than the Royal Mint was suggesting in the first place. The Royal Mint put a little bit of buffer on it, and Alan still claims today that the amount of money he saved the Royal Mint paid for the rest of his work for the rest of his career, and he didn't have to do anything. Government computing, very early stages, got to remember that. When calculators and any computing, calculators were rare. Computing was done by mainframes at best, there were still punch cards around. 
But how do you estimate the power of government computing and what's going to be required? Another work for the Civil Service Department. And pay modelling. This became something that we're still doing today in OR in government and the concept of pay creep. And Mick himself was involved in some of this early days analysis of this. You give everyone a pay award of X percent, why doesn't the pay bill go up by X percent? Because we had arcane civil service pay scales which meant everyone crept up a bit. And therefore the pay bill went up more than the pay award and then people got worried. So actually how do you model that? How do you factor in different factors about the manpower model? So, how do we actually expand into other departments? The Fulton report also recommended each department has its own planning unit. Uh, Ken James persuaded Armstrong that it should include OR staff in his units and started a quest to do that. Um, uh, fortunately, Edward Heath beats Harold Wilson. That's not a political statement, but it's a change of leadership which causes the problems. Um, and central government planning units were dropped in favour of management reviews. Again, when you've been around long enough, you're just moving the deck chairs around a bit and changing the labels, but it's the same principle. And Maurice Shuttler joins, and he convinced people that the, actually OR had a role to play in management reviews. And it was Maurice and Ken that actually drove forward the first real expansion through the early 70s. And this is taken from a sketch that Maurice provided for Maurice Shuttler provided for Maurice Kirby in his book, which shows the spread of government OR departments around about 1974. And you can see those with a green border had a named OR unit. Those with a grey border, solid grey border, there was OR work being carried out. And there's a couple of dotted line areas where it was sort of work, but it was not supported by government funding, it was outside of the government. Um, by the end of the 70s, OR groups were established in that list of departments, Home Office, Treasury, Education, Trade, Environment, Transport, Export Credits, Inland Revenue, Customs and Excise, and the Property Services Agency. So it already had a hole now in about 10 government departments <coughs> excuse me, across the centre. Some examples of projects. Algorithms to search the first national police computer. You can imagine how the data was stored pretty badly. How do you actually find a way of searching it in order to find out whether suspect A is related to suspect B in a different crime? Work on the public expenditure survey, estimating how much it's going to cost government each year. Forecasting national debt. That work has still fed into the macroeconomic models that Treasury use today. Developing marginal cost approach to forecasting education spending and various manpower models, not just on the pay ones, but actually forecasting the numbers of specialist staff required in very specialist roles. Um, I've already touched on being pioneers in pay modelling and the concept of salary creep. Uh, how do you replace purchase tax when we went into the uh, EU with what we're going to have with VAT? And then there was modelling declaration of losses, in quotes, from bonded gin warehouses. And how all the losses tended to be just before the tolerance level that you needed to report them. <laughs> Health, uh, lots of projects here. Balance of care and optimal hospital size. NHS performance indicators. Uh, sending out floppy disks with performance indicators for people to use on a BBC micro to benchmark their performance. Modelling trials of cancer treatments. Predicting snow depth on motorways, various examples of relocating government, I've touched on that already, PAYE computerisation, and then just a list, fire safety, efficiency of courts, processing imports, drug smuggling, introduction of police recorded interviews and its impact. So it was already establishing itself as a way of improving different aspects of government work. But the characteristics of those early days, not just the projects themselves, what was actually happening to the people? Well, again, like it was in the war, it's that close proximity to decision makers which was making it a success. And that's still true to today. They were responsive to the customer needs, recognising that they're not always asking the right question, but they probably know the question they need to be asking and they can help them. They can explain the answers in clear English. And this is a theme still today that I see with new recruits coming through. Brilliantly academic, brilliantly technical, but there are still some comms issues that we need to address. There was this collaborative working with other professions, knowing what they could do, knowing what they needed others to do. Lack of any computing resources, which meant visualisations involved lots of coloured pencils. And a quote I like, the typist was your best friend and on the critical path to delivery. You were never going to send an email out to anyone, you had to write it up longhand, send it to the typist, hope it came back correct, otherwise it was going round again, before it went out to your client or your customer. Okay, so that's the early days. 
What does that mean about establishing a profession? It was definitely very collaborative. Most, all of the OR groups, people were known to each other. There was a bit of a social network. There was definitely a fun aspect as well. They often followed swap jobs. Um, and sometime in the 70s, they had an annual get-together. I put it as an annual get-together there. They went to Sunningdale. Somebody described it as a boozy Friday afternoon, and they stayed over Saturday and then convinced their other halves that they'd done lots of serious work when they went back on Saturday afternoon. But the point was they were sharing experiences. Because we were actually starting to develop a network of people working across different government departments, and how could we learn from each other? Um, just to give you an idea of the hard times they had at Sunningdale. <laughs> That's where I went on my first induction course in 1986. In fact, Jeff, you were speaking at that induction course. Um, my only trivial fact about that is the Iranian embassy siege, that's where they took the people afterwards to actually hold them up because it was so secure. I wonder what they were trying to do to hold up the civil servants in there beforehand. Um, all of this became more formalised and by 77 it had led to the formation of Dork. <laughs> Greatest analytical minds that we had in government at the time come up with the name Dork. Departmental OR Committee. Oh, come on. Some of you were there. What were you doing? What were you thinking? <laughs> now, serious point. There was a big gap here between the way OR and statisticians um, under the GSS were run. And it wasn't formally the Government Statistical Service then, but DORC was an attempt to bridge some of that gap. GSS was established under the same time as Wilson, but they quickly had senior people running systems in the centre for them, facilitated moves, central promotion and recruitment. And that second bullet there, I think, really hits home for me. They actually regard themselves as being more of part of the profession than they did part of their home department. And they would see moving between departments as part of their career path. We were way behind. The early success for Dork was maintaining a mailing list. Don't underestimate that in a time before email, when you're trying to track down who lives where and which offices you're going to send stuff to. That allowed us to start sharing vacancies, but let's be honest, some of these groups were pretty small and they didn't necessarily want to support movement all the time. Um, however, the offer there, for external people coming in, it will be much more attractive if you're not only going to go and work in the Home Office, let's say. You could work in any part of government. And we realised that this is actually part of our cell. And a link-in agreement was drawn up which said that we would allow to share all government rules internally so that we would allow people to move around and create more opportunities for people. So two subcommittees, education and recruitment, setting up of annual conferences, not dissimilar to this, but in order for us to share our work, do some networking. And we established formal training, college, training courses at the OR, uh, sorry, OR training courses at the Sunningdale College. And we used OR Society colleagues to actually run some of those courses. Sharing recruitment tasks was much, very much an own brainer. In fact, I put to the side there about DSTL MOD. This is probably the time in my mind where because DSTL was quite large and established from its historical war um, follow-on and its heritage from there, um, they were able to do their own recruitment. But they also, there was a bit of a stigma about people wanting to go and work for defence at that particular time, so there was a bit of a divide. And this is where we get what was pretty much artificial and has stayed for quite some time between civil and military OR within the civil service. First mention of cross-government circular. Okay, that doesn't sound much, but it was important. Everyone read it. They collected it and they looked forward to receiving the next one, even if it was going to be five months away. The first dedicated induction course was around 1980. And finally, they changed the name from Dork to Corn, the Committee for OR Management. Still not really grabbing you by much, is it there? <clears throat> um, not everyone agreed we should have been in a profession. And I understand there were some quite heated debates that we are actually a mixed discipline federation and we shouldn't be calling ourselves as one particular profession we are a multitude of those but the central identity clearly helped the professional grow and by 87 we're talking about 124 OR professionals spread across 11 departments so now growth um, when Ken James retired Peter Turner took over and other early leaders including Andrew Holt Jeff Jones who's here today Roger Tilley who basically led the profession through to the late 90s and you can, we, we don't have all the stories around that period between the 80s and 90s, and I think that's another piece of the work that we still need to continue. 
But I can remember when I came in in 86, and um, Andrew Holt was then who I uh, was the most senior person I was meeting, and I was scared. Yes. <laughs> it was impressive. These people knew stuff. And there was me coming in as a graduate, and I was being asked to do some stuff in education, and within about a month, I was producing calculations of the teacher's pay bill and was appearing on the front page of the newspapers. Lucky it was right, but it was quite worrying when he appears on the front page of newspapers you've been in the job for four weeks. I thought, wow, this is something different, okay. These people were pioneers and leading and changing how the profession was in, uh, uh, envisaged. Um, this diagram, it's one of my favourite diagrams, some of you may have seen me use it before. This shows, from all the way over here, doo -doo 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 -doo, this goes back, right the way back to the early days of the Home Office, um, the War Office, the Admiralty. In fact, if I pick up the dates from here, 1782, 1854, 1831. And these lines trace the lineage through to the current government department. This is around about 2008, actually, the position here. But I want to just zoom in a bit on this section. Hopefully that's a bit easier to read. Hopefully it's a bit easier to read. Uh, what you can... Can I do this? Sorry, it's a test of technology. Oh, wow, that's a novel idea. So this period here, 90 to 2000, and each of those tram lines reflects a big government department and chunk of its work moving into another government department. And what you can see... Oh, sorry, I've shrunk that again. But you get the idea pretty much organised chaos. And that's a function of machinery of government. And it happens every... happens most times there is a change in the political power because they want to do things differently. They want to organise things differently. They want to create different priorities. And actually, you create a priority by having its name in the title of the department. That might sound pretty petty, but if it's not in the title of the department, no one knows where the subject lives. So that's what they do about organising government. And we saw some really big changes. DHSS groups split into DH and DSS, and DSS then later became DWP when it picked up aspect, uh, uh, bits of employment. Customers next size merged with revenue to form HMRC, big merger. And Ministry of Justice was created from nowhere, really from parts of the Home Office and uh, the Lord Chancellor's Department. And DIUS, Department for Innovation, University and Skills, was created from parts of Education and Employment, DTI, and then was merged back into what was DTI two years later. But that's how government happens. That happens a lot. So it happens enough to cause some turmoil, churn, and change. But you, if you're an analyst working in one of those departments, not only does everything change in your organisation, your senior people change, your leaders change, but actually the drive for work and incentives change, and suddenly you're merging with another different organisation. So it has a big effect. This one here I've picked up more recently, um, it's the same kind of diagram, but I'm just highlighting the fact all of this churn here is really to create the department to exit the European Union. And it's actually what's going on behind the scenes in order to run that, which is why the, part, the government at the moment is, is pretty slow at doing things because all the energy is in that bottom right-hand corner. Okay, some game changers from 2000. The adding it up report, and we'll read this. Better analysis requires commitment throughout government. Ministers and senior civil servants have a crucial leadership role in expecting and demanding sound-based analysis in support of policy. They need better understanding of the importance of analysis and how it can contribute to the good decisions and policy outcomes. Okay, long-winded, but important. This was coming out of the Cabinet Office. It was coming out under Blair, and the idea here was we're not good enough in government in doing analysis. We're not good enough politicians, senior people, in looking for analysis. What do we need to do to improve it? We also had our first combined conference, which was run by Mick Hudson and Ruth Kaufman was chair of, of Gores at the time. Um, and the anecdote, which Mick won't, won't mind me saying, is it was the morning after the night before dinner and the Cabinet Secretary, Richard Wilson, was invited to speak and he, he was slightly nervous about what was going to happen in the room at the time. And Richard Wilson started asking various questions, and there was a group of people at the back who were making quite a lot of noise because they were still enjoying the evening before. And he asked the question, and then suddenly somebody at the back suddenly went for him and said, well, why haven't you got any analysis at the centre of government? 
You're here saying it's important about how we use analysis. Why can't you, you actually put a decent team to help you advise your people in the centre about how you're going to do this? That was me. <laughs> uh, a colleague, some of you may know, Ed Hagger, was sitting behind me, beside me, just put his head in his hands, going, go away as we do this. Um, and it was a bit of a turning point, not just for me, because it realised, why am I asking him? Why don't we just do something about it? I then got the opportunity to go and work in the Prime Minister's delivery unit, and that was it. I was one level stair away, my boss, straight to the Prime Minister, in producing analysis. And some of that really had an impact. I'm not saying it all did. We probably could have done more, but we certainly had some successes. We also started to professionalise the profession in the middle by having a central management unit in order to give us support for the profession overall. The OR Society, a partner throughout a lot of this process. We attended each other's events, keynote and plenary presentations at Maine and Young OR Conference, not just me, but many of my colleagues. We had JAWS articles, including two special government editions. Howard here in the audience produced one of those. Um, supporting the society's projects, especially local groups. Hosting Euro President's Conference in HM Treasury. Um, and we have reps on various OR committees and occasionally um, the president comes from the government OR service. But what you won't see is the stuff that we're doing in the centre to really promote OR within government. The 2005 Heads of Analysis was, were created and OR was at the table from the beginning. And this was quite a big step because previously it would have been the economists and the statisticians and maybe the scientists. But we made sure that OR and the social researchers were there as well. And it was quite a useful linking to right to the top to the permanent secretary of the Treasury. The Analytical Coordination Working Group, nearly as badly named as DORC, um, but was there to join up the analytical professions. It was the support teams realising, hang on, have you got this letter? We've got that letter as well. Should we all do a combined response? Simple stuff, really. But when you're talking about different professions in different organisations, it's important. <coughs> um, Gores chaired the first Heads of Analysis Conference. That was quite a big step, because all the senior heads of the other professions were more senior, but it was our role to actually chair it, and we've chaired everyone since. We, we were part of the establishment of Departmental Directors of Analysis Network, DDAN, Desperate Dan. Um, this was where we, the first time we really got the chief analysts together around the table on a regular basis to talk about what's going on, about their resources, professionalism, analytical aspects for their department. And then one of the sort of crowning points of the time that I've been there is we introduced the fast stream, which won't mean anything as a term for most of you, but if you think it's about, it's a management trainee grade, an introduction grade for accelerated progression and promotion. And that really put us on a par with the economists and statisticians, which had the fast stream process in play for quite some time. And suddenly we would be taken seriously and became a much more attractive profession overall. And this year, and I don't tend to linger on it now, we've actually now created the government analysis function, which is joining up the analytical professions even more, and more information is available on gov.uk. So, Corn became Gauze in 1998, became serious about professional standards. The logo might seem a bit petty, it was really quite important because it actually meant that we had a brand that we could put on things and show people and people recognise it. And the name, Government OR Service, not Management Committee. It actually meant we were providing something for other people. Building on the other frameworks, professional skills for government, we had our full competency framework for OR grades in 2007. We had earlier versions before that, but it was a full one for all grades. And it still forms the basis, because it stood the test of time, for our recruitment and promotion panels. And when they brought one in for the all civil servants in 2012, we were the first profession to be integrated into that framework as a professional framework. I put these up as just some of our conferences, and we started to raise the game as we were doing those through the 2000s. Uh, that one there at Heathrow, which Jeff Griffiths attended, and was probably the first time we set up a regular attendance from either the President or the Vice President of the OR Society to come along and do a keynote. And his memory of that is a rather drunken Bollywood evening. Um, however, it was a good conference. Um, and one other other highlight there, this one here, again a few others in the room were at this, where we took the Gores conference and merged it with the other analysis conferences and actually tried to shake up what the government was doing around big data. Now, it was much more of a showcase of all the different examples of big data, and we produced a report which went round to every permanent secretary of, I think it was about 50-odd case studies of different areas where big data is making a difference. Not all of those have gone further. Some of them have. Oh, you can also see, in periods of austerity, we go boring. 
Um, mentoring, important for the profession, training the middle ranking of OR staff, career paths, re revamped induction course. Now, those of you working in organisations, particularly universities, you may have all of these support mechanisms in place. For a cross-government profession, when it isn't part of your day job, this was something that we had to bring together through a volunteer basis to establish. The revamped induction course, the Forge Centre Community, this was really important to me and I'm still passionate about the way that we run these. We get 40, 45 people along to these, and we take them away, and in current climate it's very difficult to do a residential course, but we get them away for two days, and we actually show them what it's like to not be working in their department, that there is something different, because they come in and they become a home office person or an education person, but they don't realise there's a wider profession. Now again, that might seem obvious, but they don't get it in their day job. And for me, one of the really big points of that is, on at least two occasions now, I've had someone come, back, come up to me at the end of those conferences and saying, I now get it. I'm not going to leave. And you think suddenly you've cracked it. OK, growth. What you've got there, uh, this is from 1988. Small departments here. The dotted lines refer, am I trying to reflect where mergers and uh, departments have split? And that's the current position in 2018. Quite significant growth in some departments. Not in all, by any means. What has that meant overall? Well, we were civil service department, then Dork, then Corm, and this is what it's led to. We're now standing about 745 OR analysts, which from those early days is really impressive. That straddles 27 different departments. And you can see there's a big growth there in, ninth, in the early noughties, which came from the Adding Up initiative. And there were similar increases, I have to admit, in the economists and statisticians as well. Um, I tried to overlay this with sort of the political situation. So going from the far left there, so that would be Wilson, then Heath, then Wilson, then uh, Cam um, Callahan, thank you, then Thatcher, then Major, then Blair, then Brown, then Coalition, then Cameron, then May. Um, and there was definitely an increase there during the Labour Party, but it's actually carried on, and it's carried on not because of political issues, I think it's more carried on because there's just greater use of data. There's more information available. There are greater opportunities for us to make a difference. And there's a real change in the way that analysis is being used. And I come back to those some professional groupings that we had on some of those earlier slides. Um, I've overlaid this one now with the totals across the bottom because there's some other departments. What's interesting is now we've got sort of 90 odd people in other departments, uh, not just those big hitters that we've seen in the past. And that's the spread. Um, I look at that and I think that's impressive. Then I look at it again and I feel slightly disappointed sometimes about this sort of long tail. But I know some of these departments of similar size down here were actually, are now up here in this area. Uh, the anomaly there is the Ministry of Defence. These numbers don't include the analysts, analysts in DSTL. These are the Gores badge analysts. There are another 400 or so, give or take, who are doing OR within the Department for Science and Technology Laboratory for the MOD. Uh, it doesn't include consultants, it doesn't include those mixed disciplinary teams. These are the people we would say that we have brought in through our recruitment and are assessed against the Gore's professional standards. Oh, hang on, more recent examples. Um, I mean, forecasting rail demand, modelling benefits, proton beam therapy, performance dashboards, hospital demand, waiting times, social care costs, admin costs of housing, council tax benefit, modelling job centres, workforce modelling, public sector pay, migration and immigration forecasting, border controls during the Olympics, model tax compliance, benefit fraud, civil and family court system, pay, PAYE systems dynamics, optimisation of blood levels, HR modelling, attendance, sick leave, MOT compliance, modelling police air bases and their fleet, energy rod, supply in the UK, broadband Wi-Fi access, Predictive analytics on Twitter norovirus, predicting criminal activity, smuggling tobacco drugs, illicit beer market, reoffending. That's just a sample. Working in government is so broad now. Um, that's probably because we've got too many problems. Um, and they need fixing. But the point is they are areas. And I can't go into the details of some of those projects. I'm putting them up there as headlines for you. But the point here is to illustrate the sheer breadth of where OR teams are working. And they may be working in multidisciplinary teams supporting those. So, next steps. 
Um, this story is in no way complete, and I feel a bit of a fraud saying it's got 50 years in it. It covers that time span, but there are some big gaps in the middle. Um, and there are many examples we've omitted, because po possibly we don't know about them, and in the interest of time, I mean, the work that we did early on, when we brought a team of people in, some old hands, some very wise people came into the MOD and just sat there and talked to us for two hours about their memories. It was brilliant, it was fascinating, we need to do it again. But we also need to try and capture some more of that, which is sort of like post-1980 and going forward. And my current heads of profession are working in that particular space. Um, many recent projects are still live, which makes it quite difficult to document them in this way and actually record them, because often a piece of analysis will go up, and sometimes it is really liked by the current administration. It may cause a decision to be taken. It may not be liked by the next administration, and then that analysis actually is not something you want in the public domain. Uh, we can debate that one later. Um, we plan to put mixed paper up on the Gore's website and we'll invite comments on it. And the point is we want to make it a living document. It is not finished. Some of you will be a part of that story and you'll say, actually, that's not true. And that's good. Tell us. And what we will do is we'll make this evolve. And we'll be looking to hold a, a bigger social event towards the end of the year where we get some of these players back together and also to keep this document growing and expanding. So we've actually got something which stores the history of the Government OR service. Um, hopefully we can use some of that to actually be part of Impact or another OR Society article somewhere along the line, but I think there's a story here to be told which sits along the history of the OR Society. Next steps. Uh, sorry, I talked about that. Including more recent examples. I was touched by the comments made earlier about the, the next 40 years, 50 years, however you want to look at it, of where the OR Society was going to be. And I was looking at what is the future for Government OR. What's going to happen around devolution, Europe, Russia, um, terrorism, cybercrime? I've got no idea. Um, some of you may know me for being someone who used to ever tell you how many days it was to the next election. I really can't tell you. A week, two weeks, a month, a year? It is going to change. Government is really, not, not chaotic, I would say, it's really... Um, bumpy and that's creating lots of opportunities and the point of this is is that government's always like that at different times but it's a really interesting area the only thing certain about the future is it's uncertain as far as the laws of mathematics refer to reality they are not certain and as far as they are certain they do not refer to reality from Einstein but Douglas Adams I think summed it up better we demand rigidly defined areas of doubt and uncertainty it's our greatest opportunity. So I'm not worried about the future. I'm looking at it as it's where we're going to be playing a key role. Because Government OR is going to be part of the future. 